Hello viewer, welcome to Science Hub. I'm Lara Mbithi, a Form 4 student at Loreto Convent Value. And I'm Elaine Mahome. So today we're going to talk about acids, bases and salts. An acid is a proton donor. And in previous classes we've learned that a proton is a positive particle in an atom. An acid is also a substance that dissociates in water to give hydrogen ions as the only positively charged ions. So in acids we have two major types of acids mainly mineral acids and organic acids. An organic acid is an acid that occurs naturally, while a mineral acid is made in a laboratory. So ex examples of organic acids are methanoic acid, ethanoic acid, propanoic acid, while mineral acids are hydrochloric acid and sulfuric acid. So um, from major experiments, we've seen that mineral acids are stronger than organic acid. This is because they dissociate fully, producing the hydrogen atoms and the cation atoms. So for example, when a mineral acid reacts, for example, if the mineral acid is HX aqueous, it fully dissociates into H positive ions, the hydrogen ions which is aqueous because it's in a solution because it's in a solution and the X ions which is aqueous because it's in a solution while in organic acids for example HY which is aqueous it will dissociate not fully but partially that's why we, this means fully, this means partially into hydrogen atoms which are aqueous and the Y atoms which are negative which are aqueous which means that this can easily go back to this and um, in acids there are different methods of determining the strength of acids for example we have using the pH value we are going to demonstrate using the PL which is hydrogen chloride acid we put about five drops of hydrogen chloride acid into a test tube and then you add universal indicator as you can see there's a color change from colorless to pink red pinkish red we are going to compare it to the colors on this pH chart so first of all, we put it on the first color, which is pH 1. As you can see, the colors correspond. So this tells us that this acid has a pH value of 1. Um, the next acid is sulfuric acid, which she's going to show us the pH value of the sulfuric acid. Okay, I'll take a portion of sulfuric acid. So you put about five drops, or about two cubic centimeters of sulfuric acid, then using a universal indicator, it's about two. <coughs> so as you can see um, there are different colors in a universal indicator and you put it on the first color which is pH 1 and from there we can conclude that sulfuric acid has a pH value of um, 1 so these are strong acids as you can see because strong acids have lower pH values compared to weak acids we are also going to determine the strength of acids using the reactions with metals and we are going to use magnesium ribbon. So here is magnesium ribbon and a test tube. So first we will put hydrochloric acid and a small portion of the magnesium ribbon in a test tube.
So, as you can see, there's effervescence with the production of a colorless gas. Um, from the equations, we can see that we can determine that the gas is hydrogen gas. Okay, so I will show you about the equation, how we have de determined the gas produced to be hydrogen. So, we got this so magnesium plus, I used hydrochloric acid. Should give you magnesium chloride and hydrogen gas. So from this equation, we can see that the colorless gas being produced is hydrogen gas, and that is how we can the gas, the gas to be hydrogen. So my friend will take over and show us the strength of sulfuric acid. Um, so we are going to do the same same procedure, but this time we're going to use sulfuric acid. We're going to take a test tube and put about five drops of the sulfuric acid. Then we are going to add the universal not sorry, we're going to put the metal in to find out if the reaction is going to produce a hydrogen gas like the previous reaction. As you can see, the same thing happens, but the reaction is more rapid than with HCl, producing more effervescence and more gas until the whole metal is reacted with the acid. So, heat is also produced as you touch, you feel that the test tube on the lower part is hot because of the reaction taking place. So basically what happens is the, the magnesium metal, which is in solid form, reacts with sulfuric acid, which is in aqueous form, to produce magnesium sulfate, which is in solid state, magnesium sulfate, and hydrogen gas. Yes. So next, we are going to talk about a base. A base is a proton acceptor. When the acid loses the proton, the base accepts the proton. A base can also be defined as a substance that dissociates in water to give the hydroxide ions as the negatively charged ions. Mm -hmm. So in bases, the major examples of bases that we learn in the laboratory is sodium hydroxide and ammonium. So um, we are going to see the strength of the bases using the inversal indicator. Take a test tube and we're going, this is ammonium solution. We're going to put about five drops and then we're going to take the inversal indicator and put. So there's a color change from colorless to Yes. So we are going to place this on the chart to find out what's the pH value of this solution. So we start from 7 because 7 is neutral and going up becomes a base. So from 7, from 8, it doesn't match the color. 9 doesn't. 10 doesn't, 11. So this is of pH value 11. Um, the next base we are going to look at is ammonium hydroxide.
We are going to follow the same procedure. You put a small amount of sodium hydroxide in a clean righteous tube. Then you put about two to three drops of universal indicator. So we are going to use the pH scale to determine the pH value of sodium hydroxide. So we start from pH 7, which is neutral, going up. So pH 8 doesn't go with the color change. pH 9 doesn't go. So 10 doesn't. So we'll go with pH 11. So sodium hydroxide, as you can see, has a pH value of 11. So there are also other methods of determining the strength of bases, which is, um, <coughs> this method is electrical conductivity, which we're going to look at later. Okay, from the experiments, we've determined, we've seen that uh, strong acids have a lower pH value, while strong bases have a higher pH value. So from there, we're going to look at the effect of a solvent in an acid-base character. So if you're asked, what's the effect of a solvent on an acid? So here we're going to, def to look at polar solvents and non-polar solvents. So basically, polar solvents are liquids in where acids and bases ionize in them. So um, for example, water. Water is the, on is the only polar solvent that we know here. So... Um, Water has a partially negative charge and a positive charge. So, water is oxygen. As you can see, um, here the hydrogen ions are positively charged and the oxygen ions are negatively charged. So um, the acid here is the hydrogen and the base here is the oxygen. So the acids and bases ionize in them. Then um, non-polar solvents, the acids and bases do not ionize in them. They remain as molecules. So um, from there we are going to move to salts. So my friend is going to define a salt. So um, so far, we have defined acids, bases, and now we're in the last part of the topic, which is salt. A salt is an ionic compound formed by the cation of a base and an anion of an acid. So, um, for example, let's see what a cation is. A cation is a positive particle in a compound. So, if we have a compound as HX, which is dissociate, which is up right now. Associate to form H ions, which are in aqueous form, and X, which is in aqueous form. Since this is an acid, this is a cation because it is positively charged. And if you have a base, for example, sodium hydroxide, it will dissociate into sodium, which is in aqueous. And the hydroxide ions, which are negative. So in this reaction, this is a base and this is an anion because it is negatively charged. So the salt will be formed between the cation, which is a H, plus the OH. Yeah. Yes, to form, for example, H, H2, and O. So, um, under salts, we have different salts which have different solubilities. For example, all nitrates in salts are soluble. And in carbonates, all carbonates are insoluble apart from sodium, apart from sodium carbonate, lithium carbonate, ammonium carbonate, and potassium carbonate. And in sulfates, they are all soluble apart from barium, which is sparingly, and calcium, which is sparingly. And in chloride, they are all soluble apart from lead chloride, which is sparingly. 
Sparingly means that it's only soluble in warm water, but not in cold water. So under salt, we have qualitative analysis, where we look at different ions and how they react in different solutions. So the first cation we're going to look at is magnesium, which is which has a charge of T plus. So um in this um salt, we're going to look for our magnesium salt. We're going to put magnesium powder in a test tube. about two spoons from a spatula and we're going to put about five drops of sodium hydroxide Put fast water so we can make two like solutions from this solution. We are going to separate it into two. And then we're going to put sodium hydroxide drop wise first of all, then we shake. And if it doesn't dissolve, we're supposed to put it in excess sodium hydroxide. The salt has not yet dissolved, so we're going to put in excess. As we shake, we can see that the salt still doesn't dissolve. That signifies that the magnesium ions are insoluble in sodium hydroxide, both in dropwise and in excess. So next, we are going to zinc. We are going to take um, a zinc salt. We are going to use zinc sulfate. So we are going to make a solution out of uh, zinc sulfate since it's in solid so that you can be able to determine the ions. So you add distilled water and shake the mixture. Uh, so we are going to see the presence of cations in zinc sulfate solution and the cations in this case are zinc so we are going to determine it using aqueous sodium hydroxide or ammonium solution so I'll demonstrate it using sodium hydroxide so um, you put a few drops of sodium hydroxide, hydroxide sorry, until uh, in excess as you can see, a white precipitate is formed, so um, you put it in excess, that was a liquid. A white precipitate does not dissolve, so this shows that zinc ions are present. So my friend will show you the um, presence of copper ions. Um, so we are going to use the same solution which was zinc sulfate, but this time we're going to use ammonium solution. So we're going to take our ammonium solution over here, which is in two moles, and we're going to first of all put a few drops. As you can see, a white precipitate is formed when we put the ammonium solution. Now we put it in excess. As you can see, um, the white precipitate is slowly 
dissolving. This shows that the zinc cations are soluble in excess in the ammonium hydroxide solution. Next, we are going to go to lead. Over here we have lead chloride. I'm going to put about two spoons. And then we're going to add water to make a solution. We normally use distilled water and not tap water because tap water may have some minerals which are not needed in equation. We make a white colored solution when we mix the lead chloride with this. We're going to separate these two. into two equal solutions so we can react them both with sodium hydroxide and ammonium. First of all, I'm going to take us through with sodium hydroxide. First, we're going to put a few drops. When you put a few drops of sodium hydroxide, the solution turns white, which means that there's a white precipitate formed. When you add it in excess, The white precipitate slowly dissolves. Next, we are going to use ammonium solution, which is going to take us through. So the same procedure is followed. Um, we put a few drops of ammonia solution. Uh, as you can see, a white precipitate is formed and it's insoluble. So you add excess ammonia in, in the solution. So if you add, you see the white precipitate does not dissolve. So um, a white precipitate insoluble in excess shows the presence of lead to ions. So from there we are going to move to aluminium ions. For now we have aluminium sulfates. The salt is kind of hard because it absorbs some of the moisture in the atmosphere and became compact. So we are going to add distilled water to make a solution out of our ammonium sulfate. Shake it until all the big crystal separates. It's almost there. As you can see, the solution is clear. There. And we're going to separate this solution into two so we can have the reaction between sodium hydroxide and ammonium. First of all, I'm going to use ammon we're going to use sodium hydroxide with the solution we just made from ammonium sulfate. After putting about three drops, a white precipitate is formed. We're going to add the sodium hydroxide until it's in excess. The white precipitate persists, it does not dissolve. Yeah. So, with the, with the other solution, we are going to react it with aluminium. So, we are going to test for the presence of aluminium ions in the solution. 
So you put a few drops of ammonium. As you can see, a white precipitate is formed, so you add it in excess. So as you can see, the white precipitate is insoluble. So we can conclude that um, aluminium ions are present. Okay, the next salt is copper. All copper salts are blue in nature. We're putting about three spoons using the small spatula and making a solution out of it. Let's transfer it into a boiling tea, which is bigger so as to make it easier. As you can see, a blue solution is formed due to the copper ions present. We're going to separate this solution into two. Yeah. We are going to repeat the same same procedure, but first of all, we are going to use ammonium solution. First of all, we are going to put about three drops. A blue precipitate is formed. When we add the ammonium in excess, the blue precipitate still persists and does not dissolve. With the other part of the solution, we are going to use, since we had used ammonium, we are going to use sodium hydroxide. You can see a blue precipitate is formed. When added in excess, the blue precipitate still persists. Um, our next salt is iron. We have two types of iron salts. We have iron 2 salts and iron 3 salts. Um, when you see a container written ferrous sulfate, the ferrous means that it is iron 3 sulfate. The O U S at the end. Because fer is the symbol for iron. Using one are full of the iron and we're going to add water. This solution, we're going to separate it into two solutions so as to react with the sodium hydroxide and the ammonium ions. We try as possible to make the two solutions equal. There. First of all, we are going to use ammonium hydroxide solution. As the other procedures, we are going to first of all put a few drops. A green precipitate is formed. When we add the ammonium hydroxide in excess, the green precipitate is still there. It does not dissolve in excess. So, so far, we've dealt with about six salts, starting with magnesium salt, which is, we are testing cations. So, we are testing magnesium cation, then we went to zinc cation, then we went to lead cation, aluminium, copper, and iron. In all of them, some salts dissolve in excess using either ammonium or sodium hydroxide solution, while others were still having precipitate while in excess. So I'm going to write a short formula of how to remember how different salts are either soluble or insoluble. I'm going to have three columns for the salt. For the cation, either being soluble 
In the beginning, we started with magnesium, which is two plus, and it was insoluble in both of them, both of them, which means sodium hydroxide and ammonium. Then we go to zinc, which was soluble in both of them. Then we go to lead, which is soluble in sodium hydroxide and insoluble with ammonium solution. Then we go to aluminium, which is three plus, which is soluble in the same sodium hydroxide and soluble in ammonium hydroxide. And we have the copper, which were soluble in ammonium, but insoluble in sodium hydroxide. And lastly, we have iron. We dealt with iron 3, which was insoluble for the term. So, that wraps up the test for cations. Um, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you.